John chapter 12, verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles, I don't even have a Bible up here. I'll have to get one. Um, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted. And how important is that? It's very important. You don't believe the gospel with your brain and be saved. You believe it with your heart. So, Pastor, where do you get that from? Are you crazy? Romans 10. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It is not the head knowledge. There's a lot of people in this world who have a head knowledge of Jesus Christ, but it is not in their heart. Study uh, Ezekiel 14 if you want to learn more about that. Okay? In fact, where is my Bible? Hang on here. There it is, right, right where I left it. Now, I don't remember why I wanted it, but anyway. Um, let's see here. In verse, uh, verse 40 again. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted. And I should heal them. These things said Esaias. And this is Jesus talking. It's your red letter Bible now. This is Jesus talking. When he saw his glory and spake of him. Now where he was talking about from Esaias or Isaiah. Was number one Isaiah 53. Everybody turn there. Isaiah 53. In fact I'm going to. I'm going to do this. Isaiah 53. When, when my wife, I mentioned my wife buying me a copy. It was a reprint of the 1611 King James Bible. And the first place I ever used that at was at a church. And I think it was Brother Charlie Jameson's church out in Oklahoma. And I had, I had everybody open up to Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 53 in their, in their King James Bible. And then I had that reprint of the original King James Bible, which I had been told was significantly different than the Bible we had now. And I read them every verse from my 1611 Bible. And you know what it was? It matched 100% every word that they had in their Bible, the, which the last revision of the King James took place somewhere around 1740, 1750, somewhere around in there. I don't, I don't remember what it was. But our Bible has not been altered for over, well, 400 and 400 and 11 years now. It's not been altered. So who hath believed our report? And that's the gospel. You must believe the report of the gospel. You must believe what God said. It is not enough to, for me to say, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you can be saved tonight and not give scripture and people be saved. It's not possible that anybody can be saved from my words. It's not possible. How do I get that? Uh, Second Peter chapter 1, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth 
forever. My words are corruptible. God's words are not. Who, uh, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when he shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was in his 30s, but even if Jesus would have lived into his 70s, he never would have had facial reconstruction. He would have never gotten his skin tightened to take away his wrinkles. Jesus would have never used Grecian formula to make his hair not gray anymore. He would have never done that. Jesus was not, he came not being good looking because he did not want to draw people with his looks. He wanted to draw them with his love. Um, verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And you have to remember that this same passage was being read by the Ethiopian eunuch, who was a Jew on his way to worship at Jerusalem, uh, as, the, as the law required, and he did not understand who this was, and Philip got into his chariot, and the eunuch said, speaketh, speaketh he of himself, Isaiah, or some other? And the Bible says that at that place in Isaiah, Philip then began to preach and teach to him Jesus Christ. Verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to, to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Do you not recognize the fact that when Jesus stood before both Herod and Pilate and when they asked him specifically, Are you the Son of God? Did he ever say, sure I am? No. He said, thou hast said. He refused to glorify himself because the glory that he was going to receive was going to be on the cross and not out of his own mouth glorifying himself. Hey, I'm God here. You can't kill me. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall, who shall declare his generation? In other words, God's looking for people in this generation to declare the gospel to people who live right now. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Was that fulfilled? Joseph of Arimathea, one of the Sanhedrin, a very rich powerful man donated which it's almost like if God gave you the numbers for the lottery ahead of time is it gambling no it's a sure bet because you already know the numbers I'd play it because it's not gambling you already know so when he gave when Joseph gave Jesus his tomb he got it back amen Jesus, like, I only need it for three days. Okay? Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You look at this. God is saying that he would rather bruise his only begotten son rather than bruising us. And you wrap that around your heart for a while and you ponder that. It's almost as if God loves us as much. And I, I don't know that I believe what I'm fixing to say yet. 
but it's almost like God loves us at least as much as his son Christ, maybe even more. Willing to chastise his only begotten son so that we would not be bruised. And like I say, I'm not 100% on what I just said, so don't. And he hath put to him grief. Verse 10, when, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. In what form? I'm going to give you a little quiz. In what form did Jesus bear our, our iniquities on the cross? In what form did he do that? Everything about the cross has a symbol about it. Everything does. In what way did Christ bear our iniquities? Somebody give me... Huh? Crown of, thorns. crown of thorns. That's one of them. The crown of thorns. Thorns were the curse that God cursed the ground with when Adam transgressed and partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Somebody give me another one. Another way. Yes. The stripes. Okay. He, there's, there's laws. In the Old Testament, that for certain transgressions, death wasn't the punishment, stripes were. In fact, and Brother Reg Kelly made a pretty good argument one time against prisons. Because he said, in the Old Testament Jewish law, there were no prisons. There was either the sentence of death, the sentence of stripes, a sentence of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a sentence of retribution. In other words, you had to pay back. But there were no prisons. Now you think about that for a while. We live in a country that is a prison society. Uh, Make sure I get this word right, Cubby. Recidivism? Rec yeah, what she said. <laughs> what that means is a guy gets sent to prison. Let's say he does a year. Out of a five-year sentence, they let him out. Three weeks later, he's coming back in. Why? Because he went back out to the same thing that they put him in prison for. Recidivism. Right? Okay? And it does, in many cases, the prison system in this country does not work. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm glad I'm not running the country. But if you notice, if you go through the laws, in the Old Testament, you will see there was no jail, there was no prison, there was nothing. Once a man was found guilty, there was an instant execution of judgment, either by death or by stripes or other things. So he took our stripes. Give me another one. Yes. The actual nails. Huh? The nails. The nails. Yeah, the hanging upon a tree. Okay? Cursed is anyone. He took our curse away. By the way, let, and since you said that, let me, t let me tell those, those of you who are here and those of you online, who, and I guarantee you somebody's lied to you. If you are a born-again Christian, you listen to me, if you are a born-again Christian, is it possible that you can have a generational curse on you? No! Christ took all the curses and the things that were against us and nailed them to his cross. Just because your granddaddy uh, was, was, some, was a bootlegger or a wino or an adulterer or anything else, God is not laying that to your charge in the form of a generational curse. He's not doing it. So don't believe that garbage. That comes out of that charismatic movement stuff. I got one more for you. 
They disrobed him. Now, we don't like, we don't have paintings of a completely naked Jesus on the cross, but he was. And what he did was in that is that he bore the shame of our nakedness on his cross. Aren't you glad? Mm -mm -mm. So where was, what verse was that? What verse was I in? Uh, yeah, verse 11. For he shall bear their iniquities. Everything that happened to Jesus on the cross, the, the whipping, the crown of thorns, the disrobing, being, being hung on a tree, all of those things was Christ bearing the, the he, was he was satisfying the demands of the law. Therefore, verse 12, will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. I like that because that's number three. Three crosses. Three types of sin. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. 30 years old. Or 33 years old. Sold for 33, 30 pieces of silver. He was numbered with the transgressors. And by the way, that prophecy is removed out of every modern Bible translation. Take it out, Cubby. When, when the King James says uh, that there was a thief, one on one side and one on the left, and thus was fulfilled the prophecy, he was numbered with the transgressors, the new translations e eliminate the fulfillment of that prophecy by eliminating that phrase out of their Bibles. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So that's Isaiah 53. And the point of that, back in John chapter 12, was that though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And I made a point about this uh, over the weekend, is that here Israel, in the wilderness, gets to see all these miracles. They see Moses kill Og the giant. They see Joshua kill Sihon, king of the Amorites, who also was a giant. The Bible says it was as tall as one of the cedars of Lebanon, and those cedars of Lebanon were huge. Uh, they got to see the Red Sea open up. They got to see Pharaoh and his armies destroyed in that Red Sea. They saw water come out of a rock. They saw manna falling down from heaven every morning. They saw the glory of God upon Mount Sinai. They saw the, covenant, the Ten Commandments written with God's own finger. They saw this. They saw the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night every day for 40 years. They saw this thing and yet they still turned their back on God. So this is why Jesus said that it's an adulterous generation that's always seeking after a sign. Blessed are they who see and believe. Yea, rather blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. I've not seen any of these miracles. I've read about them, and I believe every single one of them. Amen. Um, we've already read that. John, now back to John chapter 12, verse 42. Uh, in fact, no, 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 no. Getting ahead of myself. I don't have this in my notes. Turn to Isaiah 28. Because he mentions... In John 12, in verse 39, another passage from Isaiah. Therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. In Isaiah 28, Woe to, this is the drunkards of Ephraim. And who made them drunk? Babylon did. Babylon gave them the cup of her fornication and her drunkenness and they committed fornication and they were drunkards. They fornicated against God. And so God then says to them in verse 7, they've erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink and they are swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. 
for all tables are full of vomit. What happens when you get way too drunk? You vomit. So what he means by that, see this here? This is the table. In the New Testament, this is, we call this the communion table. This is the table upon which um, generally our two deacons, John and Sterling, would give out the elements of the bread and the wine to us and we would partake of the Lord's Supper. What if instead of handing you a cup of, of the fruit of the vine, new wine, grape juice, they handed you a cup of vomit and said, here, drink it. Would you do it? No, that's silly. So in my opinion, the only thing worse than preachers serving up vomit in every service are the dogs in the congregation who lap up the vomit. Okay? Regurgitated. They've, they've taken in from the Word of God, but they've regurgitated it and vomited it out, and they say, here, eat this, and that's what they do. The tables are full of vomit. And then he says in verse 9, whom shall he teach knowledge? God is looking for people that he can train. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips, that's Moses, and another tongue, that's the Greek New Testament as given to us on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, they probably spoke every language, well, 17 of them that I counted, with the exception of Hebrew. Why? God was signifying at that point right then, He was fulfilling Revelation 28, 11. And the number 11 is a number for confusion. For with stammering lips and another tongue will, I, will He speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. That's what we just got done seeing here in Isaiah, or John chapter 12. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept, verse 13, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward. Why, why backward? Paul said... I press toward the mark. The direction that you and I are going in is forward. Toward Christ. The Jews, after Christ died on the cross, rose again. They plainly saw him. He was there 40 days. Upwards of 500 people were eyewitnesses of the fact that Jesus was alive after he died on the cross and yet they refused to believe it so instead of going forward with Paul they went backward to Sinai a young man who came out of this church that at one time knew the gospel has now gone backward to Mount Sinai saying that we must keep the law we must only go to church on the Sabbath day Saturday we must do that we must partake in Passover seders which if you study the traditions of the Jews and their Passover seders you will find out that they bear almost no resemblance whatsoever to the Passover that Moses commanded the Jews to participate in. Almost, almost no resemblance whatsoever. But anyway, that's why they fall backward and are broken and snared and taken. And that's what he's saying here. God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them a Bible now in every language in the world except the one they speak, Hebrew. So when you think about it, Paul said, when you change the law to account for a man from the tribe of Judah to be a high priest, 
wherein the law of the Old Testament had no accommodation for a man from Judah to be the high priest. It was only a Levite. With the change in the high priest, the change in the priesthood, naturally there must be a change in the law. Not only was there a change in the law, there was a change in the language that that law was written in. It was written in Greek, which was purely a Gentile language. Purely a Gentile language. Now, uh, verse, let's see here. Now, John 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I'm going to give you my testimony once again. Uh, I'm not going to talk about anybody else. I'm going to talk about me. I grew up in the denomination that we used to be a part of. Those preachers that I saw both here and at quarterly meetings and other church revival meetings and down at Bible camp in Niangua, Missouri, those preachers that I saw down there were my heroes. I can remember when I was about, oh, probably 13, 14 years old, there was a preacher up in St. Louis, Free Will Baptist, and uh, man, I loved his preaching. He was, I mean, he was a firecracker when he preached. I mean, he really put it on. Well, he got to a place where he didn't feel like the church was paying him enough money. So he started selling insurance on the side and got pretty good at it. And he actually then started making more money selling insurance than he did in preaching. Not only that, but because he was out almost every night going into people's homes selling insurance, he met up with a few ladies, if you get my drift, one of which he maintained an affair with and his wife proceeded in divorcing him over it and he quit, he quit the church altogether. And I, I, as a young man, I grieved over this. I grieved over it. Because I was hoping for the day that he would come to our church and preach a revival. Okay? But he loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So, I grow up in this church. I do everything I can for this church. When I was about 16, I, I led the singing. At times, I, it would be up to me to play the piano because the piano player would be sick or out of town or something like that. When I got into Bible college... I served the college. I went to two of them. I served them well. I sang in their music groups. Did everything I could for the denomination. I wanted my name out there. One man came to me and he told me, he said, Mike, you really have a future in this denomination. But he was mad at me because I hadn't paid the rent and he was the financial guy at the college. So he was kind of mad at me because I, I was behind on my rent. And he, but he said, Mike, you really have a future in this denomination. Don't ruin it by not paying your bills. Then when I came back, Lisa and I got married and the Lord led us down to Richwoods um, after I was ordained, they let me preach one of the district quarterly meetings. And I received a lot of pats on the back, a lot of praise for the message I preached. Men were saying of me, uh, boy, it just makes a difference in a man when God ordains him and calls him to the ministry and he's now pastoring. It just makes a difference in somebody. They'd never heard me preach like that before. 
said all these nice things about me, and I was really enjoying this. Got invited to the state meeting. They wanted me to sing and be part of the music that was there. And what I was hoping for was that at some point then I would be called to preach at the state meeting. And God knew where my mind was going. I, w I was the rising star, or so I thought, in the denomination, and I enjoyed the praise of those men. So one day, one of those men that I highly regarded offended me deeply. And it burnt me bad. And then not too long after that, the head of the Missouri Free Will Baptists, he and I got into it over the King James issue. I thought I knew him. I thought I knew him. I thought he would be a good, solid King James man. I found out very quickly he was not. In fact, Melissa, he told, this same man told John Uter, John, you know what your problem is? Your problem is you've been hanging around and listening to Mike Hoggard too much. That's your problem. That's what he said. And I actually called. They were going to have a state meeting. And I called and was going to ask, if I could have booth space at that meeting and that, that state leader asked me, what are you going to do with this booth? Well, I'm going to put my, my videos out there and the books I've written. He said, we don't have any space for you. Just like that. He didn't check on it. He didn't say, let me get back to you. He just said, we don't have space for you. I said, what are you saying? He said, I'm telling you no. He said, now if you want to stand outside with all your stuff and try to give it out as people leave, that's fine. But you're not bringing that stuff into our meeting. I gave the, the youth camp that we went to, had a little bookstore, and I donated books and videos because the people that I knew that ran that store, uh, it was Tracy's mom and dad, Alicia. And they were good friends of ours. And those videos were on the King James issue. And one of the board members saw it, and they asked them, what are these doing here? And they said, well, Mike gave them to us for free. He said, we could sell them, keep the money. And he said, you get them out of there right now. And what God did to me was allowed me to have my feelings hurt so deeply. I was so deeply wounded that I said to that whole denomination, adios, which I think is Spanish for goodbye or something like that. Pardon my French. But that was me. I loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And God took, and I mean took every bit of it away. Every bit of it. Uh, Rose might, might remember the time where I had made a video called The Emerging Church. God laid it on my heart to send a copy of that videotape to every Free Will Baptist Church in the state of Missouri. And I told Rose, I told Lisa, I said, get ready. The devil's fixing to beat us to death because I'm going to send this video out. And um, sure enough, we started getting a beating over it. I don't remember what happened, but it was pretty bad for a while. And we only had one preacher out of some 300 churches that we sent that to. I had one preacher that said, Mike, thank you for, for that making that video. Just one. And so it dawned on me that I was chasing down the praise of men and God was not going to, by His grace, was not going to allow that to happen. So read this verse again. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on Him, like Nicodemus, 
Joseph of Arimathea. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. And I'll tell you what, I would rather be put out of the denomination and be accepted by God than the other way around. And this is why we're not joining anybody. Nobody can tell this church what to preach, what to practice. Nobody can. Because nobody owns us but God. Amen to that. Now what happens when you do not confess Jesus before men? What happens? What did Jesus say happens? If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father which is in heaven. And I want to tell you something. That ought to scare you. To think that you've got it made and you show up to heaven and Jesus looks at you and you smile and say, Hi, Jesus, remember me? And Jesus says, I never knew you. I never knew you. That ought to scare you. So in John 12, 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that, hath, he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Now ponder that for a while. We, no man, the Bible says, no man has seen God at any time. So I just love it when these televangelist stuff like that said I saw God you're a liar um, I've had sort of a rough week this week um, and in the midst of that one guy called here Alicia actually had taken the phone call and and she kind of muffled the phone and said to me, Dad, this guy's saying, I said, who is it? And she said, this, this guy's saying he knows the day and the hour of Jesus' return. Now, I was in a mood. So I said, tell him, put him, tell him that I'll pick up the phone here in a minute. So she talked to him a little. She had to cut him off. Sir, can I get you to stop talking for a minute? Um, Pastor Mike wants to talk to you. He said, oh, great. So she put him on hold, and I went to my office. And he started in on his nonsense. And I said, sir, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give me the scripture that convinces me that you know the day and the hour. Of the Lord's return and he went to Luke 12 and he he started in verse 41 he was going to end up in verse 45 but he started in verse 40 or 41 and every verse that he read he had to inject his comments and his theories into it and he read about he read down to verse 44 and I said sir can I say something to you I said I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not but in every verse that you've read to me so far You've ejected your commentary into it when actually it doesn't have anything to do with it. I said, what I'm asking, I'm going to ask you this again. Here's what I want. I want you to just read me the scripture that tells me that you know the day and the hour. So he was getting a little ramped up. And uh, he read, I guess, verse 45. And I said, well... Where's the day and the hour? I don't see it. He gave me, he went, he said, first, you know, first, first Thessalonians 5 says that we're children of the day, not children of night, that, and that day should not overtake us as a thief. And I said, yeah, I, I believe that. I said, let me, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Hang on a second. I got a piece of paper and a pen. I said, from what I understood, my daughter telling me, you believe you actually know the day and the hour. Is that correct? And he said, I sure do. I said, okay, hang on a second. 
what's your, what's your name again? He gave me his name. And I said, now, tell me what day it's going to be. And he said, it's going to be September 25th this year. And then he said, at 546 Jerusalem time, a.m. And I said, okay, I want to make sure I got this right. September 25th, 546 in the morning, Israel, Jerusalem time. He said, that's exactly right. And I said, um, what's your phone number? And he gave me his phone number. And I said, here's what I'm going to do. On September 26th, I'm going to call you. And that really made him mad. You mean you're not, even, you're not even going to hear me out on this? And I said, no, because, and he went click. <laughs> now, if you want, I've got it hanging up here in that room. I nailed it to the wall, and I'm going to keep my promise. On September 26th, I'm going to call this guy. And I told John I'm going to use his phone. Because he won't, if he recognizes my, if my name comes up on the phone, he, he'll, he probably won't answer it. Because he would have been raptured then, by then. Do what? Okay. I, I'm going to record it. Uh, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I have not seen God. I have not seen Jesus Christ. But I believe the Bible's description of Christ. And in that sense, I believe that he and the Father are one. Amen? Now, I ain't got time. I got a whole deal on this. He said, I am, a, I am come a light into the world. Roy, do you remember the day that God shone the light on you and you saw yourself for how you really were? Made a difference, didn't it? That whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. I don't like darkness. Spiritual darkness, I don't like it. I don't like people being in spiritual darkness. It's the reason why I sent Ralph, the producer, John 3.16, in German, Martin Luther, to him. I wanted it to be in German so he could understand it as a German would understand it. Not as an Englishman, but as a German. I wanted him to know that God loves him so much that he gave his only begotten son for him. And to abide in darkness, people, I've been in dark places in my life, very dark, very dark. When I see a faint light off in the distance, that's where I'm going. Because I don't like being in the dark. Amen.